But it's a big welcome back to Sailing Anarchy for Joran Marstrom, um, the uh, the guy, the, the the master of carbon, a guy who's pretty much done everything there can, there can be done in the world of high performance building um, of boats, as well as Kure Jung. Did I say that right, Kure? That's good enough. <laughs> it's, it sounds a little bit like Cooter, which we're, which I don't know if you've ever seen the Dukes <laughs> of Hazard, but um, uh, anyway, I won't call you Cooter. I'll call you Kuda. Kuda, yeah. the, the primary designer for uh, for the Marston M32, and um, a guy who's worked on a ton of projects as well. Welcome, guys, to uh, Sailing Anarchy's interview. Uh, we also want to welcome you to the Sailing Anarchy family, becoming uh, advertisers in part to promote this new Marston 32, this unbelievably fast, um, well, beach cat on steroids, you know. Um, so, so we're going to talk about that and a few other things. Uh, it's a uh, uh, welcome, guys. How are things in uh, in beautiful Sweden? Oh, well, <laughs> snow day is not really the best day. It's kind of thirty knots, no wind, bloody cold outside because we are very close to the ocean. But otherwise, it's good. Yeah, we've got our, our we've got uh, we've got about twenty knots and uh, you know minus five degrees. And uh, you can see I'm wearing the uh, the hat. Not, 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 and it's not because I'm 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 trying to be nice to Quantum. It's because I'm in my basement. It's freezing. Okay. Um, okay. <laughs> Uh, so anyway, for, uh, welcome also from the far north, but you guys are obviously well further north uh, than yeah. me. But, you know, Joran, uh, um, I think first off, um, I, I want to understand, you know, as far as I can tell, I think you guys have five of these Marstrom 32s already sold, um, a couple of them already sailing. You know, you guys, you, you do things pretty quietly, but are you surprised at how, how many you've sold uh, uh, so quickly of this 32-foot uh, cat? Yeah, we was pretty happy. We sold at least four boats on the paper, and that is pretty good. Because most guys like to try before they buy, but we managed to sell four boats. And they are spread out a little bit. So one boat is in Phuket, and one is in Montenegro, and one in Germany, and one on Lago di Garda. So, so, so we're not going to see too many uh, one design regattas in early 2012, no, are we? <laughs> Sell some more boats, but we're working hard on it, so I think it will be good. Yeah, and and uh, and to point out, you know, I was just thumbing through some of your your website, um, um, and uh, and it's amazing how clean that that 32 fits in a container. So obviously it's easy to ship, but you know, realistically, um, no no one design boat, which this is clearly targeted at a one market, no one design boat succeeds without um, a regular circuit or, or at least some events that they know they're going to do every year. Have you guys planned for that and where do you see sort of uh, uh, these kind of uh, classes, these kind of fleets that you need springing up or what events are you going to bring them to? Uh, in Europe there is pretty much uh, quite a lot of events. There are some in Sweden and uh, also in Italy like in in Lago di Garda, Gorla and uh, Multicento and then we have the, on the Swiss lakes it's pretty big and yeah and we're also discussing to, right now to uh, be sailing in Kiel during the Kiel week. Which, which <laughs> Kiel week is huge and is going to be massive this year. I think, yeah. you've, I think you've got the MOD70s as well that, uh, there this year. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that's cool. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. All right, so we see it developing uh, um, in Europe. There's plenty of places to play. Um, we also saw in the first outing of the boat on Lake Garda, uh, you saw M32s come in first and second place. <laughs> so it's uh, a pretty good start uh, right out uh, of the box, huh? <laughs> That's good. You're on, I think, and, and you know what, actually maybe this is more for Kuda. Um, yep. I, you know, in this in this niche, and we can define it in, in the 10-meter in the uh, multi-hull, racing multi-hull niche, you've got, I wouldn't say a crowded market, but there are boats out there. There's um, the Lightspeed Catamaran, obviously. There's the Sea Cart. Um, there's the uh, SL33 now that the Team New Zealand is training on, um, and there's the Marshall M32, a couple of other uh, boats. But these are the, 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 the production boats that are out there. Can you explain how the, the M32 differs in design, design philosophies to what we may be more familiar with? Yeah, if we look at uh, the sea cart and the light speed, it, they're more competitors to each other because they are you can live on board, it's more ocean going, it's more like standard boats, it's like an X40 or something like that uh, if you take a keel boat. Our boat is more pure racing boat, like the SL33, but the SL33 is essentially a lake racer from the beginning. 
and built like a late racer and our boat is built to be more average to be on the sea also coastal race not that much big offshore races but coastal races and lake races so it's not a pure lake racer but if you're going to be aboard for less than 24 hours even in big waves that the uh the marstrom can handle it yeah it can handle quite big waves it's Perhaps not nothing that you sail in the big oceans, but a coastal race that you have like six, seven hours is no problem. Well, I, I mean, I'm curious about this. I, again, looking through the specifications on the boat, it's a thousand pounds, right? It's 450 okay. kilograms, so it's yeah. a, a, just a hair over a thousand pounds, which yeah. is really, really. Li I mean, that's light. That's uh, that's half of a Melgus 24. That's I mean, that's a really light boat. That's that's two, that's two F uh, uh, NACRA 20s. Uh, which is, that's mind blowing right there. But now you're saying that it can handle going out in uh, uh, having a regatta in, uh, let's say, Porto Cervo in six to eight foot waves. You're saying it can handle this stuff. How do you create such an incredibly light boat that can still that could not get torn apart by swells and uh, uh, and, and chop? No, actually, we have the same amount of fibers uh, in the skin as uh, Arma 60. Wow. Uh, but uh, due to autoclave and so on, we use much, much less adhesive to glue the skin in, to the honeycomb and much less adhesive in the skin. It's more yes, fibrous and less epoxy. Well, what's and that, well, explain this to our readers, because not everyone knows what an autoclave is, which is something that's common in medicine and Formula yeah. One. Um, explain how you use it and, and, and why the other guys don't. It's a high-pressure cooker. That's essential. It's instead of just having vacuum that you get up to uh, 10 tons of pressure per square meter, we get uh, up to 60 or 80 tons of pressure per square meter. We put extra pressure, and that makes it glue much better together, everything. And also, it's a little bit higher temperature, so we can use it. The epoxy becomes a little bit stronger too. So you've got that much more um, saturation in the in the fabric um, uh, that 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 the the material is just much more uniform and dense, correct? Uh, yeah, that's right. Got it. Okay. So now we understand how you're able to, to do what you do. Um, and uh, and and John was remarking in um, John Casey was remarking during after that steeplechase race where he was on the Marstrom M20 racing uh, against the uh, the Nacra F20 Carbon. Which also yep. carbon, but significantly heavier than the. Yep. I mean, significantly heavier. And yet, John was remarking how he was amazed that the boat didn't rack, which is you know twist, yep. didn't rack yep. at all, which uh, yep. uh, he was unused to considering all the sailing he does. You know, even yep. the extreme 40s, even some of these other boats, these these boats rack, and 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 these very new boats, the M20, M32, you got you guys are building don't. Um, I, it's pretty amazing stuff. What what else about the design design philosophy? Um, do you think really stands out? Yeah, it's it's uh, designed to be simple to use and simple. Uh, it's easy to rig the boat and you we are designed the trailers. So you load it in three hours. You put the boat in pieces and put it on the trailer and go. And you can uh, use a normal car. You don't need a heavy four wheel tractor to drive because it's it's only like uh, 1,500 kilo total with trailer everything. So <laughs> that's a normal car is good enough. So that's good, and also then it's very simple setup. So it goes fast. We don't have a jib because it's le much less work to put the boat together when you don't need the jib, and you don't need really a jib because uh, it doesn't give much for performance. Only in some, like uh, in low region, no wind, the wind, a jib maybe is an advantage. But others, upwind, and so it's never better with the jib. It's always you can go fast because of the rotating mast. And you can use it, it's for sure better without the deep. Well, I mean, if it's in, go ahead, sorry. Yeah, uh, and also it's easy to attack because without the deep. Because the deep always uh, do some uh, flapping in the wind when you go over, and the, and the boat is extremely light, so there is no, it uh, doesn't mow if you don't get powered up. So it turns quick, easy, and doesn't stop so much without the deep. So, so I mean, let's think about conventional wisdom here. You know, if you're if you go and take sailing lessons on a Hobie 14, yep. yeah. you know, 
they teach you how to sail backwards because you're not going to get through attack in light air, right? And, so uh, why is this boat different than that without the head sail? It was, uh, uh, it's a couple of things. First of all, we don't have a deep uh, hull that lays very deep in the water, so it's very easy to turn it. And because there's no jib, uh, the sail actually is functioning up to very low angles, just like the wing sail uh, on America's Cup. Right. So you don't have that many degrees to tack, and no jib that starts uh, stopping the speed before you get over. But of course, if you do it wrong, you can still uh, not succeed sometimes, but uh, that's if you do something wrong, then it's a little bit harder to get going again. But right, right, right. But right. It, turns, it turns very easy. It's amazing. It's just go around like a keelboat. Yeah, it's, it normally you just sail and then you turn and then it's turned. And we've certainly seen it with the Sea Cats and with the AC 45s without the jib. They're really manageable. Um, yep. uh, and, and also, you know, when you go offshore and, and look at some of these super fast machines like Bank Pop or the Mod 70s, they're limited to their upwind angle by the fact that they have to have a jib. Yeah, um, yeah. And you can see it when you're sailing on the boat. So because they have the jib and all the head sails, the mast is further back. Um, yeah. And you watch where the jib is sheeted. Even, even you know, you're going upwind at 20 knots or you're going downwind at 25 knots. The yeah. jib's still sheeted, sheeted as close as it can cl go without stalling. And that's yeah. and what, how many more degrees do you get out of having a, a, a cat or a unirig like you have? No, but uh, we really need to get uh, upwind to angles, apparent wind angles about 19, 18, 19 degrees uh, for the boat. Uh, and that shows that you cannot do that with the jib. Uh, uh, you don't have, uh, you still probably have 45 degrees. Uh, and, well, with the jib, you know, I mean, with the jib and flat water, you figure 22, 23 degrees apparent. Is that about right? Yeah, probably. Then you cannot go uh, higher because uh, the jib cannot function in uh, less apparent wind. And right. if you want to go faster than the wind speed, upwind, uh, it's a magic number. Is you have to get down to apparent wind angle of 19 degrees. Otherwise, you're not faster VMG upwind than the wind speed. That's the magic number. Hmm. Uh, and that's the physics. It doesn't matter how much sail area you have on a small boat, it will still not be fast upwind. Got it. So, so guys, for for um, for that crossover, let's say uh, the identical boat had a head sail, um, where would the crossover be where the where the no head sail route becomes quicker? Is it two knots? Is it three knots with lump? Is it, what is it? Uh, well, it's always, even in very light wind condition, if you Designed a boat for just the main sail. You have a bigger main sail, so you have the same sail area. So, never really, if you design from the beginning. The only thing is that uh, with a four sail or jib, you can have different jibs for different wind speeds. Right. Uh, if you compare it to like an extreme lake racer like the M2, that is the extreme lake racer. Right. Uh, but they rig for very light wind condition. Then uh, I would say they have a uh, in all around probably the highest speed less than four knots of wind. But the uh, stone is more than four knots of wind. Uh, we don't uh, we're not slower, and because we're not designed to be a, like a three knot wind boat. Right, because. right, right. Well, you know what the philosophy a philosophy that gives you even the same speed, even if it was the same speed, but that gets rid of jib, uh, mm -hmm. all the load on the head stay, all the load on the mast, cars, you know, winches, all that shit, just to get rid of that stuff is yeah. is, is worth it, even if you didn't get a speed, uh, an increase in speed, but here you do anyways. Yeah. So that's that's pretty, that's a, that's a, it's a great idea, and it's uh, it's good to see it on a bigger boat, you know, we obviously see it in ACATs and, and other small boats, but it's good to see it on a bigger one. Um, just real quick, before we go any further, what's the, pr I mean, if uh, uh, what's the price for a uh, uh, delivered in Europe for one of these things. If I wanted to order one today, hundred thirty thousand euros. Hundred thirty thousand euros. Okay, so that's about it's about what a Melgus thirty two costs. Interestingly enough, okay. uh, maybe a little bit less than a Melgus thirty two um, for you know two to three times the speed. So. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting stuff, boys. Um, what about 
well, let me ask you uh, uh, sort of um, this debate, and, and I bring it up because mostly John talked to me and said, you know, these boats are just so stiff it'll blow your mind. Honestly, he was he was yeah. blown away, and for a guy like that to be blown away after all his time on all those boats, you know, it's impressive. So, you know, there was a, some noise a few years ago about um, and, and and some papers on it about. Uh, boats that are too stiff leading to breakages offshore in some of these major races. Um, and that having some give in the boat uh, was actually better for the durability of, of the boat. I'm guessing you guys don't don't buy that argument. We don't agree at all. <laughs> <laughs> the thing is, if you have more stress, stretch in the fiber, that's more load in the fiber. If you have less stress in the fiber, it's less load in the fibers. I think right. the, I think the theory was is that the the the, the, the uh, shock loads, for instance, going over a wave or whatever, uh, would transfer more readily to the hull and and therefore create more load on the hull. Yeah, then, but the stiff the stiffness really comes from uh, also how you join the um, yeah. beams to the hull and so on. Uh, and uh, I know that uh, they have had a lot of problems with uh, the big catamarans uh, in that area the French catamarans, and they made it soft. You can make it that way, but you can also make it just stiff and strong. It doesn't cost that much weight if you do it uh, correctly, and they have very short load path. You just to think of the load path and join it in a natural way. Um, yeah, you get more shock loads, but the shock loads are not that high, really, on a multi even if they're very stiff. Fair enough. Fair enough. Hey, Yoran, how much does an autoclave cost that can build 32-foot hulls? <laughs> oh, <laughs> I don't know. It's long. We have used this autoclave for quite a lot of years, so I don't really know. But I think it will cost at least, uh, what do you think, for? Um, if you buy one that is, yeah. If you buy one that is for the aeronautical industry, much more. <laughs> yeah, sure. but, uh, if you build it yourself, uh, you can get it around a few hundred thousand euros. Well, I, I, and and obviously there's a re, you know there's a reason why not everyone has one, and uh, one of those reasons is I'm sure not only the cost of acquiring one, but the cost of uh, maintaining. Yeah. Um, Kota, you come from the aircraft industry. I noticed you developed some uh, uh, some planes, some gliders, all sorts of stuff. Um, how does that how does that knowledge help you in in, in, in where sailing is, is is now and where it's going with wings and 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 flatter and flatter designs and more and more speed? No, it helps a lot. The thing was, uh, I always went for being a, a, a actually a boat designer. That's why I study aeronautical engineering, uh, because this is the tradition in Sweden uh, to become a boat designer. You study aeronautical engineering. It's been since <laughs> the 1930s this way. You do not study boat design. You study airplane design, then start uh, designing boats. That's the classic way in Sweden. Marstrom um, not only builds all these boats, the ACATs, the uh, Marstrom 20s, the Extreme 40s, the M32s, all these different things. But you guys have diversified um, somewhat as well, um, and and I'm I'm always interested in what what you can make out of carbon these days. We had a video the other day from Bank Populaire, and the and the their top worker makes tables out of carbon fiber. What do you guys make out of carbon fiber, and how has that uh, business uh, changed? You know, uh, uh, your company. Yeah, we make tables too, but that's for uh, X-ray and big medicine equipment, but also. We make uh, supports now for cannon towers and cannon towers, yes, doing tests like that. And what more arms for uh, industry robots? Uh, a lot of different things. Motorcycle exhausts, too. Did I see that? Yeah. And uh, speakers uh, for high, uh, for really good sound. They want speakers that are really, really stiff. So they. Don't vibrate. Speakers. Wow. Yeah. So yeah, you can spend you can spend thousands of dollars on anything if you want to, can't you? Uh, yeah, and the speakers. Uh, I think the cheapest part is the box. Uh, actually, the uh, box we make, because the speaker is uh, the medium-sized one costs uh, about fifty thousand euros, 
and the uh, expensive one is 100,000 euros a pair. Oh wow. And uh, I think the three, I uh, mean, uh, yes, the base or the different parts, each part is more expensive than the carbon fiber parts that we're making. Is it, um, uh, is it, do you still, do you enjoy doing that stuff as well, or does it, is it just pay the bills while you get to uh, play with it's the boats? Fun to do different things. No, we love to make everything in carbon fiber. That's the main. <laughs> but of course, board boats is, is what we like to do, but it is, it's quite interesting also to do a lot of different stuff. Well, and, I, and we, can, we can see the extreme rib in the picture behind you. Yeah. Um, obviously, with uh, with a lot of them sold, a ton of them sold to the America's Cup folks. Yeah. Um, but uh, how's that been going for you? Yeah, yeah, it's uh, quite busy actually. Yeah. Even if the boat market in Europe is very low now, we still have something to do, so it's not too bad. Diversification, folks, it's the key. Um, uh, as well as foils, and, and John told me, uh, John told me without qualification that, that you know, in, in the ACAT fleet at least, nobody builds curved foils like Marstrom. Nobody even comes close. So, um, guys, let's let's move on a little bit here. Um, I, I'm curious, uh, Joran, mostly because we had a long talk in Valencia a couple of years ago. Uh, I'm, cu I'm curious about what your take is right now on the state of the America's Cup on this AC45 series. And on the coming 72s. Yeah, I am very. For me, it's very good to see how the multi hulls moving on. That's one thing. So I am very interesting to follow me very much to see what's going on, what's happening. So it's quite interesting. It's a really big thing for sailing. I'm sure it will move, especially multi hull will grow a lot. It was like it's in the past always had been something you look over your shoulder and not really accepted. Right. And this right. is a thing that will make things happen. So um, I like it. H have you already seen a change in the attitudes in uh, maybe potential customers or people at the boat <laughs> shows or? Yes. Yes, definitely. You can see it's a it's a big difference. It's more acceptable to be a multi hull sailor than it was before. Look, it only took you 50 years to get respected. <laughs> <laughs> Joran, have you seen, and obviously I'm, I'm guessing you have because you've sold so many of these boats, but um, you know, a lot of people talked about that this this could really impact the market, really get more people thinking about buying smaller multi hulls. Have you seen that as well? Yeah. You know, in Sweden, like locally in Sweden, is slow. It's moving slowly. But if you look the rest of Europe, it's a it's a difference. You can see that it's a difference. At the end of the day, like it, it can do. You know, it, we can all talk and talk. But if the, at the end of the day, people aren't spending the money, then you know the impact might not be as big as people would hope. Uh, yeah. Let's get back to the cup for a second, Joran. You know, you guys built. I don't. I don't think you had. Uh, you built what they called the fastest rig ever in the Americas in the IACC class before it broke, um, yep. uh, and 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 I would think that you would be at least consulting on some of these seventy-two footers. Are you involved at all? Are you allowed to talk about it? Or are you completely out of it? And if so, why? Uh, we, are, we are out because we are multi-hull sailors. We're not in. <laughs> Same old cup, huh? Uh. <laughs> There have been some discussion, but that's all. That's nothing. Uh, we are not involved in anything. Gotcha. Uh, a bit of a surprise and maybe a mistake for someone not to ha have yeah. you guys help out, but who knows? You know, uh, Marstrom has been a, a, a name in the ACAT class forever, um, or for a long time, anyways. At least for as long as I've been paying attention, which is a decade. Um, but these are these are awesome boats. Obviously, very high tech and a lot of arms race going on. And when you ask people around the boat park about a Marstrom ACAT, they generally tell you the same thing. They say, it's great if you're a bigger guy. It's a boat that's a work of art. There's nothing built like it. It'll last you a lifetime. But you don't see them winning the major world ch championships anymore. Why is that? Uh, because uh, <laughs> ACAT is very special. Because, you know, the top guy, that is all, almost always the same guys in the top. And uh, they're all connected to something. <laughs> you can't get in there. You can't get the good sailors sailing the boat. I think that's the main thing. Yeah, but uh, you can see that people that change from other boats have not placed higher. 
it normally plays slower when the chains both. So, so are you telling me that if Glenn Ashby was on a Marstrom, he would have won Worlds in Australia? Oh, yeah. Okay. Wherever it was. I think he could win win any boat design. He could win win everything, so it doesn't matter what he is. Well, being a being a hundred and five kilogram guy, you know, when I get on an ACAT, I think it's going to be on a Marstrom. So, uh, you know, I, 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 you let me know if you if you hear of one going for really cheap. <laughs> um, let me let me. I'm going to wrap this up with one more question, um, which I hopefully, if it pisses you off, we'll edit it out. But um, um, here's the question: I go look at Bank Populaire or Sodebo or uh, EDEC. I go look at the AC45 or the uh, Carbon F20 or the F hottest boat in the F18 or F16 okay. class. I go look at the f winning ACATs. They all look pretty similar nowadays. They're all, uh, they all have reverse bows, long bows. They tend to be uh, those knife edge on the top of the bows. Um, and, and designers have put forth compelling arguments for, for why they work. And whether they work or not, these boats are going out breaking records and winning events. Yep, yep. Marstrom continues to have what I think is, is by far the prettier look. Okay, And, and this is, this is a, honestly, I think... I think the Extreme 40 was one of the prettiest cats that, that you know that came out in ages, and it's real simple and it has a plumb bow. You guys have resisted this trend or design move. W explain that. It's quite easy. If you look at it, if you have a bow like that, look at the AC45. Can it push them really hard? No, they dive if they have this bow. Uh, and. Uh, the funny part is, it comes from the beginning and says that it should be able to come up easily, but if you have a speed, it actually pushes the bow down. It is not coming up. So you really can see that on the AC45 videos that they are pushing down. You can see sometimes sure. the whole uh, leeward uh, hull under water. And it's much better to say above the water. The water has 800 times more resistance than air. So, what do you want, air or water, through the? So, so oh. why? But why? So, if that's the case, then why do we see extreme forties going over so much more often than AC forty five? Extreme, for, extreme forty is no, not. Uh, it's oh. extremely no volume at all. They are like the wave piercing. It's actually more extreme than men and wave piercing in uh, not much volume at all. It's just that. Uh, Bow in the front is uh, great. It's not uh, it's new volume. Got it. Got it. Yeah. So the the thirty two and the twenties are so much more forgiving because they've just got so much more volume in the bow. Yeah. 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 And they, and they just don't press down. You just don't get in, in trouble because they don't press down so deep. Is that right? Exactly. Uh, and they're more progressive. If the dive is progressive, if you make it narrow upside, it goes down and. But much more, and also it's much wet, more wet. You you see all the spray. Where do the power to all the spray comes from? It all comes from the the sail that moving the boat forward. So less spray is faster than big more spray. But it's always been in the industry that uh, it's always something that is uh, fashionable, and everybody's doing it. And uh, that's always been a. This type of bow was actually very popular from 1880s to about 1914 in the power boats for, or actually military ships. War ships. Uh, the, but, the, the, uh, the dreadnought bow, right? Yeah, yeah but that but one out, that was not so useful in the it, They disappeared the about the same time you start doing tank tests. So, you know, it's so, amazing how this fashion has so much impact on every, because the only reason why they both look like this is because ACATs, ACAT are winning the world, something looks like that. Um, but they're winning because Glenn Ashby mm -hmm. sailing them, not because <laughs> bow is like that. And then everybody follow our oh, thing, oh, it's much faster to look like that, but it's for us or for so me. So would you, would you not sell more boats if you had uh, bows that did that? Probably. Yes, <laughs> for sure. We but you don't care because you'd rather sell no. good boats, is that right? No, because it's against better, I don't know, how you can explain it. <laughs> it's, a better, it's against better knowledge. It's, I like design, but uh, not uh, just design. It should be functional design. You don't, you don't want to take a step backwards, is that right? No, no. no. 
Interesting. I'm, I'm re- I really enjoyed this last part of the discussion. And, and you, you know who told me to ask about that is John. So, okay. <laughs> so guys, uh, you're going to be in Miami here in a, in a couple of months. Is that right? Uh, I hope so. We're planning now, on, uh, and everything is okay. We will ship the boat 29th of February. So 13. Of, no, I mean 13 of February. We'll arrive 13 of February. And uh, but, and uh, and do I have an invitation? Sure. <laughs> All right, folks, and you, you too, I think, will get a chance to at least dockside be able to take a look at the Marstrom M32 in Miami at the end of February. And be sure to check out marstrom.com. Um, for all the information about these boats. These guys have done a nice job uh, communicating. You can find tons of information, stories, blogs, all that stuff. So, guys, I want to thank you very much, and um, uh, welcome to the SA family. It's been a long time coming, uh, and uh, and uh, I guess uh, have a great night in beautiful, dark Sweden. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Okay. All right, cheers, guys. Cheers.